We're going to jump to 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1 through 4. The Bible tells us, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and without how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I not make thy life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. When he saw that, he arose and went for his life, came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, came and sat down under a juniper tree, and requested for himself that he might die. And said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. You can be seated. Elijah, we know, is a prophet of the Lord. Elijah, in this moment, he was struggling, he was battling. He seemed to feel as though he didn't have anything left to offer on this earth. He seemed to believe that his voice didn't carry the impact that it once had. In this moment, he feared for his life. In this moment, he believed in the power of the woman named Jezebel. Despite God using him greatly, doing miracles through him, and using him as a great witness for the people in the earth, despite God's protection and favor upon him, Elijah feared. Despite Elijah's God being the true one God that is unstoppable and perfect, he feared the woman named Jezebel. It was in this moment that Elijah felt as though his value was not significant enough to keep him around. His mind was captured by the possibility of suffering, the possibility of death, the possibility of being tortured by a woman named Jezebel. In this moment, Elijah believed that his being alive was simply a mistake. Not for the moment, not for right now. It was a mistake to allow a man that is fallible to remain on the earth. After all, what what kind of testimony would it be allowing a prophet of the Lord to suffer and to die? Nonetheless, the, the Lord, he sent an angel to minister unto Elijah. The Lord sent an angel to feed Elijah and give strength to Elijah and, and communicate to Elijah. An angel was sent two times to to minister to Elijah. He was significant enough. He had enough value for that to happen. There will be times in our walk with God where we are simply worn out. We are tired and we begin to question things and question worth and question timing, question location, question all the things that are around us that the Lord will send strength our way. Hope. He's going to send hope to us even when we don't ask for it. He's going to help us even when we don't ask for it because he loves us. There's going to be times where God makes help available to us even when we don't pray for it. Even when we don't seek after the Lord for it, he's going to send help to us. But it is up to us to receive the help. It's us to, up to us to receive the word that he has prepared for us. It's up to us to receive and accept that, that minister to us. When a brother, when a sister comes to you in prayer and has a word from the Lord, don't be skeptical or critical of that word. Could it be that the Lord sent them to minister to you? Could it be that the Lord sent them to encourage you and lift you up? Could it be that the Lord sent them to strengthen you and give you exactly what you needed at that time? To send an individual that you would love and that you can rely on. Is it possible that the Lord would send someone like that to you? Thank God that he sent an angel to Elijah. And God very well could have sent an, could have sent an, an angel or all these different things to us. He, when we're struggling, he could very well send us a, a prophet or some uh, big demonstration of the Holy Ghost. But it shouldn't always have to be a prophet or a guest speaker or a large demonstration of the Holy Ghost. We ought to be able to receive a word from the Lord with gladness from our brother or from our sister. They have no less value or credibility when they are sent from God. They have no less power when they are sent from the Lord with a word. Can I also tell you that if we wait upon the Lord, he's going to renew you. That if we trust in him and desire to be strengthened by him, he's going to give us strength. 
He's going to give us what we need for that time. It says that, but they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary and walk and not be faint in Isaiah. See, each story in the Bible has significance and oh, so many different layers that we can peel back and look at and learn different lessons about these stories. Each story, each person that's in the Bible, each group, each interaction that we see in the Bible, it teaches us something. One of the concepts that this interaction that Elijah had is this. The devil cannot destroy you. The devil cannot destroy your family. The devil cannot step into your past and change anything. The devil cannot step into your future and mess with something or destroy or stop something. This is something that this, this allows us to understand with this interaction that the devil has no power over what the Lord protects. The devil has no power to change what the Lord has established and has decided. The devil has no power over what the Lord blesses and the devil has no power over what the Lord anoints. The enemy very, very well may come in and try to invade your thought life telling you that you cannot make it. Telling you that if you go any further than where you're at now, that he's going to come in and take it from you and take that from you and, and take this from you. But the devil has no power over what the Lord anoints. The devil may very well try and invade your dreams and desire to implant seeds of fear and doubt and nightmares that you might have. The devil may come in and attempt to torment your faith, but the devil has no power over what the Lord protects. So I thank God for putting me in his hands. I thank God for keeping me and putting you in his hands. The Bible says in John, I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The devil cannot take you from the Lord's hand. The devil cannot take your mind from you if your mind is on God. The devil cannot take your heart or your family if your heart or family is on God. Another man that suggested that God made a mistake would be none other than that man named Moses. In Exodus 3, now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire. And the bush was not consumed. Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Moses said, Here am I. He said, Draw not nigh thither, hither, put off the shoes from off thy feet, for the place where you stand upon is holy. And he talks about, moreover, I'm the God of the Father, and I'm the God of Abraham, God of Isaac and Jacob. And he has a plan for Moses. He has a mission for Moses. Moses, I, I watch my children die every day. I'm paraphrasing. Moses, I watch as they are tormented and ruined by the sin of the world. I prepared a place for them. I prepared freedom and joy everlasting for them. Moses, I'm sending you to lead them. I'm sending you to reach them, and I'm sending you to be my voice to the rulers to command them to let my people go. Moses, I am calling you to do a mighty work. Moses, I'm calling you to do great things that will be testified about for generations to come. Moses' response, but I can't do it. I don't have a significant enough name. I can't speak formally or eloquently enough for them to listen to me. These people that you're calling me to, they won't listen to me. They won't follow me. Ultimately, Lord, I just don't want to do it. I don't want to do the hard thing. I, I, I do not want to pick up the responsibility that you're asking me to pick up. I, I do not want to suffer. I do not want to have pain going through this. I, I think you're making a mistake, God, in picking me. You really need to pick someone else for this call. The Lord says, no, I, I pick you. You go reach that person. You go communicate to that ruler. You go pray for that person. You go teach that Bible study. You go move by my spirit. I pick you to move. So oftentimes we look in scripture and we look at our own life and our failure is not always uh, publicly obvious. 
Our failures are not as always publicly obvious as maybe committing a crime and getting thrown in jail. Oftentimes our moment of failure is, is not as obvious as us treating someone awful or saying something awful. Often our moments of failure is resisting the Spirit of God. Our moment of failure is being aware of the Lord and what He's calling us to do and simply not doing it. It's not always obvious. People don't always know what the Lord spoke to you. They don't see that. They don't hear that. They don't hear what you hear in your heart. But it has just as much impact as the obvious ones, the failures. Resisting the Spirit of God has has direct impact on those that the Spirit is calling us to have an impact on. In Romans says, how then they shall call on him who have not believed? How, they, how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How, they, how shall they hear without a preacher? Maybe we miss an opportunity here or there, but you still have breath. And with the breath that you have, God can use it to add value to the kingdom. There's always going to be someone smarter, someone wiser, someone who might have more experience than you, someone who sings better, someone who teaches better, someone who connects better to someone than you do, someone who might have more education, someone who knows how to just reach into certain places better than you do. But that being said, there's no replacement for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. There's no replacement for someone saying simply yes to God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to oblige. I'm going to accept what you are putting on me. I'm going to follow what you are asking me to follow. There's no replacement for God working through them. No amount of talent or gifting can replace an agreement between God and his people. You aren't too old and you're not too young to add value to the kingdom. We aren't too old. We haven't made too many mistakes to add value to the kingdom. We aren't too old and there hasn't been too many mistakes made to reach a soul and make a disciple and add something to the kingdom. God made no no mistake in choosing Moses and God made no mistake in choosing you. God made no mistake in choosing a man named Ananias. In Acts, we find this man, and it says, And there was a certain disciple at Damascus in Acts 9, named Ananias. And to him said the Lord is a vision, in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. The Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the street, which is called Straight, inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prays, and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in. Isn't that cool that he, he, he showed Saul a vision of someone who was going to come meet him? If you apply that to modern day, is it possible that God would send visions to the people that we're supposed to meet and they're just waiting for us to do it? They're just waiting for us to connect to them. And maybe they're not responding to certain people because the vision showed you. Continuing, it says... And putting his hand on him that he might receive sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem. Basically, Ananias is saying, he's evil and I'm scared to reach him. He's evil and I can't talk to him because he's going to throw me in jail. He's going to persecute me. I'm going to have problems because this man is not going to listen to me. He's not going to respond to this message that I have. Ananias had trepidation before he ministered unto Paul. But the Lord simply responded. He says, go thy way. Go minister to him. Go reach him. I've shown him what I need to show him. I'm asking you to do your part. God made no mistake in this command uh, to go into all nations, every ethnicity, every culture, every religion, every country. They must all hear the name of Jesus. They must all hear about the gospel. They must all hear about the blood, and they must all hear about the redemption that is available to them. God did not make a mistake when he sent Ananias to minister to scary Saul. He he made no mistake in telling him, uh, you might have a problem here. Ananias knew that he might have a problem reaching this person. But God did not make a mistake And sending you. Whether you're aware of it or not, you have been sent. When you were filled with the Holy Ghost, God sent you with his power. We read that in Acts 1.8. But God does not make mistakes. God does not screw up. There's a story in Acts 7 of a man who understood this very thing. This man rebukes the Sanhedrin and confronts them. 
He calls them stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. Pretty harsh accusations, but truth. He confronts them in their sins for killing Jesus. The Bible says when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They were gnashed on him with their teeth, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looks up steadfastly into heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. They cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran upon him with a cord, and cast him out under the city and stoned him. The witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul, and they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He kneeled down, he cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Even while being stoned, Stephen was keenly aware that God did not fail him. Even while being stoned, Stephen was keenly aware that God did not make a mistake in directing his path and telling him where to go and telling him who to connect to. He was very aware that God did not make a mistake even when he was being stoned. Stephen was simply focused on the purpose of God and the purpose of the call that was upon his life. And the words that he said as he passed was, Lay not this sin to their charge. As the stones flew through the air, berating the skull of Stephen, God did not make a mistake. As Jesus was beaten, brutalized, and murdered on a cross, God did not make a mistake. God made no mistake as I walked through my trial and my suffering. God made no mistake when my heart was broken, my spirit was crushed, and my mind was tormented. God made no mistake in your trial. He made no mistake in your situation. Listen to you. Your, your father may have messed up, but God made no mistake in giving you that father. Your mother may have messed up, but God made no mistake by giving you that mother. God made no mistake in your darkness. He made no mistake in your loss and your trauma. He made no mistake in your addiction. He made no, no mistake in your brokenness. God doesn't make mistakes. There's a reason why we, we go through the things we do in life, whether it be our responsibility and our decisions that put us there, or things that God just simply allows us to go through to produce something in us that is not currently there. It's not a mistake of God. What other way could we learn how to weep with the weeper than to be crushed? What other way could we learn to rejoice than to be lost and then set free? What other way can we learn to pray than to be driven to a place where you had to pray, where there was nothing left for you to do but pray, where you had to be put in a place where the only person you could rely on was God. The only thing you could rely on was the word of God. How else can we learn to pray but in those times and those situations? So God didn't mis make a mistake when you were hurt and when they lied to you and when they turned their back on you. He was with you when they left you. He was with you when you were beside yourself. He was with you in every jail cell, every moment of torment and addiction, every moment of suicidal thinking, every moment of every problem, the Lord was with you. He was with you in every circumstance and situation, no matter how ugly, no matter how wretched, no matter how much it stank, no matter how much it cost or how awful it was, how sad it was, how evil it was, how terrible it was, how rotten it was. The Lord was with you in those times. The Lord was with you in those moments. The Lord was with you, and he kept you every single time. The Bible says in Romans 8, it says, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not be with him also freely given us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also make intercession for us. He intervenes for us. He steps in when we need him. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, famine, nakedness, peril or sword, shall any of these things take us from the love of God? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We're accounted as, as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. 
For I am persuaded that neither death or life, angels, principalities, powers, things present, things to come, nothing will separate us from the love of God. Say, cliche or not, sometimes it does take us living in circumstances to learn what we do really desire. Sometimes it takes us living in a little bit of darkness to learn to love living in places of light. Sometimes it takes us living in fear for a while to learn to love to live in peace. If we didn't have any peace, if we didn't have any love, and we wouldn't know any better. We don't know any better when we're in a, a place of sin. We don't know anything else when we're living in dysfunction. We don't know the, the riches and the goodness of God. And the same thing is for this world and the people of it. They know no better. They don't know the, the Holy Ghost. They don't know the love of God. They don't know the peace of God. And we look at them and we think, no, they don't want it. No, they do want it. They just don't know anything better. They don't know anything better than what they are currently living in. So they do want it. They, they do want the peace of God. They, 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 they do want addiction to not be uh, attached to them forever. They do want dysfunction and all the bad relationships in their life. They want the ability to have healthy relationships. They want the ability to think clearly. They absolutely want this Jesus. We just have to introduce them to this Jesus. You are not a victim. As much as our emotions would tell us otherwise at times. We are not a victim. We are children of God. You're not the enemy's prey. You are its conqueror. You are its subduer. You are its nightmare. The enemy absolutely fears you and fears the spirit inside of you. You are as a holy arrow piercing the resistance of the enemy. You are a holy light in this city. You are a holy light wherever you go and whenever you carry his name. You are a holy power that walks on this earth. You are what the enemy fears and you do have, you have power over that enemy. You are not a victim. No matter what you have gone through, no matter what you have seen or experienced, you're not a victim. You're a child of God that's been blood bought. You're a child of God that has unlimited access to the kingdom of God through Jesus, through the word of God, through the blood of God. So we don't have to worry about what we go through. We don't have to worry about what goes on this, in this world because we already have what we need to know. We have the Lord and we can trust him. We have the name and we can follow it. We have the blood and we are cleansed and we can present it and bring it to those who do not know it. That is the goal. That is the goal. Life doesn't always turn out the way that we want to. Life doesn't always turn out the way that we, we pictured it to turn out. We, it does not. It flat out does not. But that doesn't diminish the power or love of God. That doesn't diminish the truth or promises that he gives. That doesn't diminish the, the value that God has put on your life. If he was with you in those times, why wouldn't he be with you now? If he brought you from places of addiction to any number of things, why wouldn't he be with you now? We have this habit sometimes as Christians of, 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 of thinking of our testimonies as past tense. We have this habit of, of thinking of our testimonies and just like, thank God he delivered me. But we don't have testimonies for now and today and tomorrow and yesterday. Thank God for those testimonies, but that testimony doesn't end in the past. It doesn't, it doesn't end at deliverance. It doesn't end when those sins are taken care of. It continues, and it ought to continue. It goes forward into the future. Why wouldn't he be with us when we step out in faith? Why wouldn't he be with us when we pursue his will in ways that we have not before? Why wouldn't he be with you when you move forward in faith in ways that you are scared to? When you do things that you have not done before, why wouldn't the Lord be with you in that moment? When you pray in ways that you haven't prayed before, why wouldn't God decide, I'm going to be with him, I'm going to follow him, I'm going to walk with him, and I'm going to show him his path as he pursues faith? We've got to keep pressing, we've got to keep pushing, and be focused for the will of God, for the kingdom of God. We cannot let fear or anything else tell you that you don't make a difference. You do make a difference. You do make an impact. You are here for a reason. You are here for a purpose. You are needed here. You are needed in this body. You are needed in this church. You are needed in this city. Don't think that you're not needed. The Lord has need of you. The Lord has need of your talents and your giftings. The things that he uses in you, he has need of you. You're not wasted space. Your praise isn't wasted space. Your, your prayers isn't wasted words. 
The effort that you put in, it's not in vain and it's not wasted. It does have eternal impact. We don't always see it in the moment, but you have impact and you are needed for this present time. There's a a reason that we remember names in the Bible. We remember names like Elijah, Moses, Ananias. We remember them with, with fondness and appreciation, with honor even. And we should. We should honor people that live for God. We should honor people who obey God and follow after him and and live a life that's faithful. We should honor that. These individuals, they they fought against their flesh. They fought against their insecurities. Uh, They fought against their fears. These men and women of God, they overcame them to walk in the will of God. They overcame them to, to walk in victory with God. Whether you have an Elijah-like ministry, because those exist today. Whether you have a a ministry that is like Moses, because that exists today. Whether God called you to have an Ananias-like ministry, because that also exists today. It's needed. Every ministry is needed. Every effort is needed. The areas that each of those men worked in, they're needed to be worked in today. There are needs that must be met. We need the miraculous. We need leaders to rise in every area of the church. We need compassionate disciple makers. We need warriors. We need musicians. We need teachers. We need preachers. We need prophets, apostles, evangelists. We need every bit of them. And I wonder if we could receive it. I wonder if we could receive it in our spirits that God has need of me here. God has need of me right now. Whatever you're doing, whoever you're connected to, there's a reason that you're there. And we, it's so easy to get caught up in that, that temptation, that lie that says, I, I don't hold a certain position, so my impact is limited. So we use that, that emotionally as a reason to take it easy, to pull back on that accelerator a little bit. And we don't get as excited or passionate about coming to church when we don't always have something to fill specifically as a position. Human nature is funny because human nature, even outside of the church, when we're struggling to find our place, we become less passionate about the souls around us. We become less passionate about teaching Bible studies when we don't feel the burden of responsibility of position or status. So God desires that each of us would be working in his kingdom. God desires that gifts of the spirit would be expressed through every spirit-filled believer. Every spirit-filled believer should be making disciples. Every spirit-filled believer should be leading someone to the kingdom of God. Every spirit-filled believer should be able to work in a gift of the spirit throughout their life as they grow and mature and consecration and grow in their faith and love for God. It should grow and God desires that. God desires that your hands would be placed on someone and they would receive the Holy Ghost. God desires that your hands would be placed on someone, that they would be healed of their disease. They would be healed of their addiction. They would be healed of their depression and and suicidal thoughts because there are needs to be met. In the book of Acts, how else would all the people be added to the church except people other than the 12 apostles would go reach them? There are too many people in this world for licensed ministers to only reach. There are too many people in this world for licensed ministers to be the only ones that preach, the only ones that teach, the only ones that do miracles. The church and body of Christ, that is the the mechanism, that is the machine that God has, has created to reach the world, to reach the earth. God decides that he wants and will use children, young people, old people, young people, uh, middle-aged people, children, women, men, people from all walks of life, people from all walks of experiences and cultures. He desires that each one of them would be used. Each one of them would be used. Not one of us are disqualified. Not one of us are in a place where God does not desire, I want to use that person. I want to use that person. If we could stand. We look through these stories of the Bible. And we see the outcomes now. We read the suffering and we read the the places where they overcame. We read the after effects of their decision to live for God. And it's easy for us to read it now and think, oh, you know what? God didn't make a mistake there. God didn't make a mistake because they're doing really good. They did something amazing for God. They did something wonderful for God. 
because we can see the full picture when we read the Word of God. But we, sometimes it's important to look at our picture and look at our life. And look at where we're at. And look at where we have been a little fearful. Maybe where we have been a little insecure. And realize God didn't make a mistake in asking me to do this. God didn't ask, make a mistake when he sent me to this place. And when we're in a church service, when you're at home, God is not making a mistake by saying, I want you to intercede. He's not making a mistake when he pulls at your heart and says, I, I, I need you to go reach that person. We can't brush it off and say, God, uh, there's somebody better than me to do that. No, no, there's really not because God told you. There's not a better person if God says, I want that person to do it. Because God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't make mistakes. So what I would encourage us today is take personal accountability and responsibility for the things that God has put on your heart. The things that God has put on your mind, it's not a mistake and there are, we are so good as humans as, as, as explaining away why we felt that desire to do that in that moment. Oh, that's just a big church service. It's exciting. We all want to do that. The Holy Ghost just kind of directs us to do that. It's not just excitement. It's not just excitement in the moment. 